think we're going to start the mission again on the amazing days. Hametame, Hamedame, Hamenasif. A person takes somebody's tumor, contaminates it. I think somebody's chulin. At one time, people in their throat, they would eat chulin of Tarasakovich. They would only eat it in a pure state, not if it was contaminated. And somebody goes, takes a share, it takes a rodent, and puts it on the tumor or on the tires, something which was not contaminated. Hamedame. A person takes regular wine, cooling wine, and he intermingles it into, into it truma. So what happens? So now the only person to permit to drink the wine is only Kohanim. So something which the market was a much larger market, <coughs> if you can fetch a, larger, a higher price now, has, is, has a limited market. So he's devalued the wine. But the damage is not visually noticeable, it's just wine, it's a halachic issue. Hamanasif. Want to take somebody's wine, pours libations. All this is classed with the words hesek shem The damage is not visual in the it's purely halachic state. The shogi potter. Since we rule halacha, hesek shem nikol that a damage which is not visual in, in the physical sense is not there's no liability to that damage. You potter. The mason chayiv, but a person doesn't deliberately, rabbinically, we penalize the person, and he's chayiv. He has liability. Okay. Why do you expect him to be The man is a damage. He's not a damage. On the Torah level, he's not a damage. Damage means you only if I physically diminish your item. If there's no physical diminishment, you're not a damage. But he's rendered this so it cannot be used. Does it make a difference? That's damage. That's not damage. Damage means it has to be the most examples of the Torah when it speaks about damaging. Is speaking now where the item is actually physically uh, diminished, reduced. Uh, ox gores, uh, or a person goes and breaks some somebody's uh, vessels, or whatever it may be. It's always in the physical sense. Is there a correction to any of these? No, cannot be reversed. So you can cause the monetary loss. Mon- yeah, but the monetary loss is not visual. Is not in the physical sense. It's halacha. I'll give you an example. Halacha is it but says. It's real. Doesn't make a difference. If you steal something, right? If you steal something, so the Torah says whenever you steal, you have an obligation to return the stolen object. Okay? Let's say I steal an object that's worth $10,000. And by the time, so I have an obligation to return it. By the time I return it, the value drops. It's worth $5. But I, I return the object intact as it is. So the victim who's victimized, he lost most of its value. As long as you turn the object, there's no financial liability. So they could say that's called growing. That's called indirect cause. Right? That's not direct, that's indirect. The Mara says a person steals comes before Pesach. Right? And then afterwards he returns it after Pesach. You steal a trail load of comets, hundred thousand dollars worth of comets, and then afterwards you return it after Pesach. Chomets, that's the possession of the Jew during Pesach. The haloch is you're not permitted to benefit from it. So you return to the trail only after Pesach. Does not have to pay the man a penalty. What would be if that chomets would be destroyed? First, if it's destroyed, then you have to pay value of the value that it was worth at the time of the theft. So they put the end. The shilay means the value. So if the item's intact, you pay, you just return the item. But if you don't return the item, then you have to pay value when, what, what it was worth at the time of the theft. Okay, but over there, that every, nobody disagrees there. Because here we're going to have a machlokas. Hezek shenedek, shmei hezek, lo shmei hezek. If something is not, the damage is not noticeable in the physical sense, does the Torah hold the damager liable for damages? Or we say, no, that's good, that's good, it's machlokas of Marei. That we're going to have in the Gemara. But right now, one opinion in the Gemara is, hezek shenedek, is lo shmei hezek. That the examples of the Torah, when it speaks about a damager, it's always dimishi- diminishing the item in the physical sense, not in the halachic sense. Even though you, your action has caused it to reduce the value, that's not classified as a damager. Therefore, the Mishnah is purely as a rabbinic penalty. Shogeg inadvertently, you have no liability, deliberate, we penalize you because, as Mar says, this man could, could, could create havoc in the Jewish community by being a damager, damaging things where it's in the halachic sense, so therefore we penalize him if he does it deliberately.
Somebody tied somebody else's uh, wheat with produce on behalf of another person without, without being appointed as an agent. It's not, it has no, it's not considered a tie. It's not. No. What is it? It's nothing. It's terrible. It has no impact. No. no. No effect whatsoever. So what is the case that we studied where somebody takes the right to designate it to a particular company? No. The has, has a shy look. The has a question. If I tied from my and somebody else's temple. He, the other person has a financial gain because now his, he's, his, his produce is, is going to be fully permitted to him. Do we say schia? Would a person be agreeable there to forfeit the right to give it to the Kohen? Would a person would prefer it to take from his own and retain full rights to, to be able to distribute to who he chooses to distribute? That the Lord leaves it on his own. The Lord doesn't resolve that. But, but to do it where there's no question it's, it's not to the benefit of the person who owns the produce it definitely has no value whatsoever unless he's pointed as a shleia so tithing is not just a physical it's more than that sure yeah, the Torah says you have to be the, you actually have to own the produce that it should be effective okay now it's interesting there's a Mark Subis it's not even we say kingdom of God. If a person does an action, if that action is a double liability, there's a liability of the death penalty, and there's a monetary liability. Or Malchus, we say that you're absolved from the lesser liability. Malchus is less than death penalty, and monetary liability is less than death penalty, you're absolved. If the person's put to death, there's not even a question. If he was forewarned, that's kingdom of God. The greater of the of the liability, that's what they rule on. The less it, there's no rule. They don't they don't even address it. What about if he's not there? Right? There was there was no astro. And this person goes and he damages and there's a there's a, there's a financial liability. Does he pay? Mars is also not. What about if he does it inadvertently? And Shabbos inadvertently goes and he picks fruit and thinks it's Sunday. And he damages somebody else's uh, vineyard, his orchard. Now, law because he doesn't. We say King Lady Rabbi. Because since the nature of the act is, a, is an act of Chilu Shabbos, and if he would have been fooled, he would have carried the death penalty, even though in this situation, all that it, it requires is a chatos, nevertheless, he's absolved from the lesser liability. That's what Chad Misa showed me. We say King Lady Rabbi in every one of these situations. There's a discussion in uh, as what about Koris? That's what it's Mises Bezler. The liability is the death penalty. What about a spiritual excision? We say, Kimla Mdrabne. So, the halachas, we say, we rule, we don't say Kimla Mdrabne. The greater Kimla Mdrabne. We only accept what's the greater of the two. Rabba. Rabba means the greater. Okay? Not the lesser. So, Mark speaks, somebody goes and somebody else is true. He's not Kohen. So the liability in Shumas Koris. So uh, Yisrael eats someone else's Shumas so simultaneously. When is he? When is he a manager? When he swallows. So, uh, he's liable for eating when he swallows, <laughs> and he's destroying it when he goes down his gullet. <coughs> so we say Kimla Medrabi. Someone asks a question, and Mar says, "Why is the? Why? Why was Kimla Medrabi? The moment he picks it up, he picks it up, puts it in his mouth. So he became a thief the moment he picked it up." And then, so the, therefore, the, the financial liability is initially. Samara says no, because since he can bend down and he can eat it off the ground, if the only way you could eat something is by lifting it before you put it in your mouth, so then the act of lifting, of picking it up, is a, is is a necessity to eating. But since you don't have to pick it up, so the lifting it is, is unrelated. I'll give you an example. Why is a question like this? The halacha is havar is almost for shusar rabbi. Person transports something four cubits in public domain. Person picks up a knife, public domain, walks down an amos, 
and stops you for four hours. What's not, what's not local? It's liable for transporting. Transporting four cubits of public domain. Correct? That's called Havor Islam Shizurab. What if he picks up the knife and as he walks, he pierces somebody's silk? Right? So he's a damager. On the way, so he first did the Akira, but when, is he, when, when does the Molochah complete it? He, let's say he continues walking to lift the Shabbos. Yes, right. No, he's not liable. He has to bring the object <coughs> to a stationary location. So there was never so the so at when he pierced the silk, he was still in the in, in the in, in the process, the midst of doing the malocha. So Morris says, we'll say Kimley Jabinah. Maybe. Why? Because as the action that brings about the liability of death penalty is the is the action which caused the damage. See, when you pick up the object to eat. Let's say you hold the Kimli drum by Kuris. So when you pick up the truma, truma is not a necessity for eating. So the act of lifting the item and, and, and being liable for Kuris are, are unrelated to one another. Even though it happens in this situation, he picked it up to put it in his mouth, it doesn't make a difference. When he picked it up, he became a thief. And when did he when did he when was he liable for the death penalty for Kuris? Spiritual decision when he swallowed it. But over here, so we say one has no relevance to the other. Because it didn't have to happen that way. Because you were able to eat truma without lift, put it, picking it up. Right? Picking it up is the kingdom, is the act of acquisition. But Havar's Lamish Sarab, transforming something four cubits in public domain, it's not possible to be liable unless you have Akir and Hanoch. So since he pierced the silk, he did the act of damaging before the Malocha was concluded, so therefore the Malocha and the damage took place simultaneously. Therefore, we would say, Kimlein Mirabi. Okay? Good. Although when he pierced the silk, he wasn't yet liable. He wasn't yet liable. He's absolved. He's absolved. He's absolved. Even though when he w became a damager, he wasn't yet liable for the death penalty. Because if he wouldn't, let's say he wouldn't have stopped. Let's say he would have continued walking to left the Shabbos. The court would rule he was a damager. He never violated Shabbos. Correct? It's only speaking where he came to stop on Shabbos. He came to rest. So when he came to rest, so that action which caused the damage is the same action which brought about the liability of the death penalty. Same thing as the case with the arrow. Because the arrow wait, wait, wait. We're talking about the arrow. We're talking about the arrow. The arrow is different because they have to No, there's a split second between no, no, going no, no, through no, the no. clothes and. Wait, no. So the tomorrow wants to differentiate. Tomorrow says it's not so simple with the knife. Maybe he's not going to be liable. Why? If you shoot an arrow, you shoot an arrow. So again, you shoot an arrow on Shabbos, and the flight pattern is four out, more than four hours. And in flight, it tears through somebody's silk. When you shoot shot that arrow, you can't retrieve the arrow. So at the time of, when you put it into flight, you shot it, all intents and purposes, it landed. So because you couldn't retrieve it, the, the conclusion was, was inevitable. Right? When you see it as it concluded. So therefore, that's how you see them simultaneously. But here, let's say he would stop. He would stop, and let's say he pierced it after two hours. He walked two hours, tore through the silk. Let's say he would have stopped at that moment. Would it have been alarming? Correct? Because he had to walk four hours. And he caused the damage after two hours. So if he would have stopped then, he would not have a liability. See, even though the Morris says that factually continue walking, but since when the damage actually took place, the action itself wasn't yet identified, as part of the Malocho, it was only later, because he walked the additional two hours, maybe we wouldn't take him then. He wouldn't be responsible for his damages in that case? No, no, he would be. He would be, right? He would be, but, but if it would be an arrow, he would not. Because an arrow, once the arrow is shot, you can't retrieve the arrow. So you can't stop it after two hours. He shot it, it pierced the silk after two hours. Instead, two hours is like ten hours, because you can't retrieve the arrow. But here, when he walked through the silk with the knife, Right? At that moment, if he would have stopped at that moment, he could have stopped at that moment. He chose to work for it further. So that action is not identified as an action which causes the death penalty. Although, after fact, we, we, we combine the two, but at that t the moment of the damage, he would, the action itself wasn't yet identified as an act of, 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 of violating Shabbos. It would be liable. Therefore, he would be liable. So we would differentiate between a someone who already had walked four hours or six hours between that and someone who only walked two hours. 
No, but that's because, because once they already walk four amos and they continue walking, they eventually they're going to have to put it down. They don't have to. What happens if he'd walk continuously? Let's see, he Forever. caused the damage before Shkia, right before sundown on a Saturday, uh, Saturday afternoon. And it's t- he walks for another 20 minutes after Shabbos. So it doesn't have to be identified as neck. I'm just giving an easy case where you walk two so hours. Eventually n- so no situation on Shabbos because eventually someone could just walk for two days straight. And what about if I put it on a ledge where there's no mock on the You need dollar no, you need 16 square inches to be a location. So there are a lot of options. Right? So the ways that you, you're not going to be liable. Okay? So now we're going to talk about libations. Now, how do you do libations? Right? Libations, when you pour it when from Nessa, you pick up the wine, you lift it, and you pour it. That's the way it's done. So let's say first thing, somebody else's wine, lifts it, and then pours it. So what would you mean? It says in the mission, you do it deliberately, Chayyim. But if you say, Kim them drop me many, so one opinion is, the Nessa cannot be where he did the act of libation, because there'd be no liability in the Nessa. Because doing an act of libation before idolatry is what? Is liable for the death penalty. So again, whenever we speak about the liability of death penalty, we say we apply the principle of Kim Ling Dramni. The liability is the greater liability, not the lesser liability. But the other mission says the maze of Chayo. So therefore, Rav is going to say, therefore, the Mishnah cannot mean Nesach where you did the act of libations before idolatry, but rather means something else. Okay? So Tosis explains over here what's the machlokus. We'll see in a moment machlokus. When you do libations, do you have to lift it before you pour? Or just putting your hand in the wine and swooshing it around, that's sufficient. To be considered an act of libation. On, we're talking about on a Torah level, right? You don't have to pour. You don't pour. You have to pour. No, 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 no. The way we hold you up. You put your hand in and you sprinkle it? No, no, no. You just sw- you put your hand in the wine and just move your hand around and you think for the sake of idolatry. Is that sufficient to become Nesach on a Torah level? We have to lift it to pour. Even though you don't have to idol it, but if you have in mind for the sake of idolatry, that's considered an act of libation for idolatry. But in terms of halok, if you want to do libations of the halok, you have to do a pour. I mean, it's there. There's a pour. The question that's is, what, what about, is. What about for idolatry? We're talking for idolatry. This is idolatry. Right. But there's no pour. You don't have to do a pour. Maybe you do to be considered to be well that's what you would think well that's that, that's going to be the argument here there's why a question that think not? the mish why would I think not why would you think not why would you think because you didn't in the base of Migdosh in the base of English to, to do a proper libation that's before it that's what I'm saying for okay. idolatry not as long as that is a semblance of what they did in the base of Migdosh that's enough that's Nesach that's, that's called libations in terms of idolatry we're talking about carrying liability to death penalty right we'll see we'll see in a moment if not, the Mishnah says Nasif. The word means not Nasif, it literally means pouring. Nesif. Rabba mem Nasif Mamish. Rab says no, Nesif Nasif means literally libation. And yet says, if it means libation, and it says the Mishnah means it, Chayof. Shmuelam mem Arif. Nesif means he took Yayim Nesif. He took wine that you weren't permitted to benefit from, and he intermingled it, he mixed it into kosher wine. Okay? Madio mem Arif, my Tamalom mem Shmuel says Nasif means he took the Ayin Nesach and he mixed it into kosher wine. What does he learn? Like Rav, that he actually actually did the act of libation. Because if he did the act of libation, he carries the, he has the liability of death penalty. If that's the case, we say Kimli Dramine, even Nazir he should not be Chayif. Therefore, Menasach has to mean mixing Nesach into kosher wine. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So how does how does Rab respond to this? To Rabbi Yirmiya. As Rabbi Yirmiya says, the Amr Rabbi Yirmiya, Mishas Hagbo Hu Dekona. From the time he lifted the wine, he becomes a thief. Right? He becomes a thief. Mishai Ben Nasho Lo Havei Achas Nisul. When is the death penalty? When he actually does the pouring. As a result of that. Since it didn't happen simultaneously, therefore he has the liability, the financial liability. Okay, that's 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 why Rav learns menasech means actual libations. Of course, the lifting is not a prerequisite to the pouring. So Tosa explains, which Rav is of the opinion Nezel could be without lifting the wine. This is similar to eating the truma. You're able to since you're able to bend down to eat the truma off the ground 
You don't have to lift it to put it in your mouth. Therefore, the lifting is not a prerequisite to, to, to have the liability. Identically, lifting the wine to pour the wine for the Avodah Zarah, for the idolatry, is not a prerequisite for the Nesach. So therefore, so the moment you lifted it, you became a thief. So now the question is, according to Rav, he learns Nasif means literally Menasif. What mm-hmm. they learn as Shmuel, that it means Mari, it means mix, take Nesach, mixing it into kosher wine. Right? What does he have to learn specifically as he's learning? Omaloch, Ma'ari, Hainu Medame. Because if that's the case, the, the mission is redundant. The case, first case it says, Hametami Hamedame. What's Medame? He took Chuma wine and he mixed it into Chulin wine. Correct? So because he minimized its value, he has liability. So what's the difference between take Chum, mix it into Chulin, you take Yai Nesach, mix it into kosher wine? Same thing. So we already said you have a liability. So the Mishnah will be redundant. Therefore, Rab learns Nasch means literally the act of Nesa. He did the act of libation before the, the, the idolatry. R- Rab says it's literal, and, Sh- and Shmuel says only the specific where it mixes, or all cases that fall into this category? No, but, but our Mishnah. Mishnah is amazing, Chayev. Right. But right? Shmuel would say all, ca- all things that would fall in this category of, of making it also, as opposed to Rab who just actually said it means pouring? No, the word normally Nesa, Nasik means doing an yeah. act of libation. Except for Shmuel says it's impossible. Here it can't mean that. Because it says, it says, right? So, yeah. But if, but if you, if you can say, Kim Lehm Rabbi, how could it say, Mezid Yechayev? Therefore, we're forced to say here, Menaseh cannot mean. Right. Nisuch, it has to be Ma'ariv. It has to be he mixed it. So, Rav, what does Rav say? Let him learn Menaseh means also Ma'ariv. He says, if that's the case, it's impossible because then you have two cases which are actually the same thing. It's redundant. If you're liable when you mix Truman to Chulin, so definitely you'd be liable if you mix Nesach into Chulin. So how do, how do you, right? Because if I reduce its value, you have, you're a damager. So if I take it from value to no value, because it's a surround now, there's no question you're liable. So what does Mishnah have to tell me in Nesach? It's a Kosh game. Yeah. No, no, it's the same. No, it's the same one. It's not It's not Eino Shemun It's not Eino Shemun that a pun- there's damages. Oh, if I'm a, okay. right, if I if I'm a damager when I take from ten to five, if I take from ten to zero, I'm not a damager. Of course, you're a damager, right? So therefore, Rob says the nasech cannot mean the dama. So how does how does Shmuel respond to this? Why is the mission redundant? The idoch knosu. Now, we're saying now why the shogeg is the damager fatur, because we're saying hezek shen nikolosh mehezek. That unless the damage is in the physical sense, you're not considered damage on Torah level. So why maze it? Yes. Why would you do it deliberately? Yes. It's a penalty, right? So if it's a penalty, so would we penalize you when you take something and you only reduce it in value partially? So you reduce it totally. Why won't we penalize you? Knosu knosu lo yafir. Now, what's a penalty? A penalty. The concept is. The Chachom field, they evaluated the situation and they said because of the nature of the, of the act, you deserve to be penalized. But taking Yayin Nesach and mixing with the kosher wine, taking Chum and mixing, it's a different, different act of, it's a different level of intent. It's a different level of, of doing something wrong. So maybe in one situation you would penalize, the other situation you're not going to penalize. That's Knosim and Knosim Lealfina. Just because they penalize in one situation, they may not penalize you in the other situation. For whatever reason it may be. Therefore, it's not considered redundant. The Mishnah has to tell me, according to Shmuel, not only do we penalize it when you mix Truma, even when you mix Yai Nesach into Chulin also. And what would the reason be differentiated? Mars is discussing. I mean, Truma is something which is available to most people. So you could say, you took Truma, which is available, you put it into the kosher wine, he minimized its value, because now only Kohanim can drink it. Where does a Jew have to have Yai Nesach? Yai Nesach is wine that was used for idolatry. Used for libations. He took that wine and intermingled it into the, something remote. Since it's remote, you say, they're not going to legislate a special penalty for something which is, doesn't happen that often. Right? Therefore, the Mishnah says, no, they do. It happens often enough that it has to be addressed. Therefore, not only do we penalize you when you get Truma to Chulin, 
even when you add Nezah to Chulin, we also penalize the person. Therefore, it's not considered redundant. It's a well, rabbinical. But you say, if they penalize, they penalize across the board? No. Each, each case is, 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 is a case unto itself. It's a separate evaluation. When do we penalize one? Don't we penalize you? So, if a person renders somebody else's food non-kosher, person's cooking, and he adds a few pieces... The mission is not discussing that. No, no, but he adds a few pieces of non-kosher beef, which cannot be detected, and it's in too much quantity. So that would be detected. similar to the truma. So what? What, what happens in the case? No, he does the liberty to penalize him. We will, but it's not... No, not because that's... No, rabbinical, rabbinical. But not the rice. Not the rice. Not because the rice. it's undetectable. Because visually it's undetectable. It's only halachic. It's a halachic damage. It's not a physical damage. It's not... The item has been physically diminished. Because of the halacha, therefore, its value has been lessened. It's been devalued. I understand. I mean, there's clearly damage. No uh, question. We think about it. But sure, but sure. But halachically, uh, the middle riser, there's no damage. Right. Or the, or doesn't he's not called, he's not classified as a damager for this kind of damage. What is he, what is he, middle riser? It's person? probably, uh, I'm not even sure if it's grub, it's less than grummer. Rama is the what is a damage, but since it came indirectly, indirect cause, the Torah doesn't, the court can't rule on it. But Yidei Shemayim, you call it, you call the damage, because there there is a physical diminishment, except it came through indirect cause. Here, the damage itself is only halachic, it's due to halachic reasons, and the physical sense is still intact. So maybe Yidei Shemayim, maybe you don't. The person doesn't have that liability. We continue.